Welcome to the PowerPoint show for Section 2.3. In Section 2.3, look at a little bit of history, again, dealing with John Dalton's atomic theory and some of its implications for things we actually observe. Two parts in this unit. One is Dalton's atomic theory itself, what the premises are, how it looks today. And the second one is some of the mass relationships we can gather from Dalton's theory. John Dalton was a school teacher back at the turn of the 19th century. Um, I always like to say he's a school teacher, like school teachers can't figure things out, but he was pretty sharp, regardless of what he did. He was a pretty sharp guy. And, and dealt with the atomic idea and sort of <clears throat> some of the things we see and trying to explain why those happen. And so he looked at the conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, the law of multiple proportions. His law, actually, is the law of multiple proportions. And his theory he provided uh, came up with an explanation as to why we see those things. Uh, the overall framework for his theory is called Dalton's Atomic Theory. There are four premises in Dalton's Atomic Theory. Uh, the first one is that all matter is composed of extremely small indivisible particles called atoms. You might think of these as exceptionally small billiard balls, where there's not a whole lot of internal stuff in a billiard ball. Uh, his concept was that the atoms are incredibly small little balls, and there's nothing very interesting inside of them whatsoever. His second premise is that all atoms of a given element, of the same element, are alike. And atoms of different elements are different from each other. So all carbon atoms would look just alike, all hydrogen atoms would look just alike, all nitrogen atoms would look just alike, and you get the idea. Uh, but a nitrogen atom is different than a carbon atom. You could distinguish those two if you could actually see the atoms. His third premise is that compounds, remember compounds are a chemical combination of two or more elements, compounds are made when atoms of different elements combine in fixed proportions. A couple of famous examples of that sort of thing are carbon dioxide that you hear about. CO2 is a form that has one carbon and two oxygen atoms in it. Water, H2O, has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom in it. And so his idea is compounds are made out of combinations of those atoms. And the other thing, this is important to recognize, is that when you carry out a chemical change, you don't create or destroy atoms. You just rearrange how they're connected to each other. This really helps us with the law of conservation of mass. It says if I start with X number of atoms of everything on as reactants, and then I get done reacting this thing, my products are the same atoms. They're just combined differently, and therefore their mass is going to be the same as what the starting mass was. Dalton's theory was 18, well, it's just about 200 years ago, right around now, and it's changed a little bit. Great concept, got us started very well. We found a couple of things that uh, tend to say some of his statements aren't absolutely true, but it was a good starting point. Remember, theories are always subject to revision. They're always tentative, and that's exactly what this was, a good starting theory where we've seen some changes. Uh, a couple things I'll point out in here. One is is a concept that atoms are not indivisible. That they're made up of. We find out they are made up of subatomic particles. So Dalton says they're little tiny billiard balls. It turns out we can actually take the atoms apart. We find out they have in them some of these particles that we'll see. They have electrons and protons and neutrons inside of them, and they even go smaller than that. But since we're in chemistry, we don't have to worry about that. The second thing is not all atoms of the same element are identical to each other. We're going to find out shortly about species called isotopes where two atoms of carbon can both be element, the atom carbon can be the element carbon, but they can be different from each other based on how they're constructed. And we'll run into that shortly. So how does this help us at all? Well, let's consider the law of definite proportions. And the law of definite proportions is what we said was that compounds were made that in such a way that water, for example, always had two hydrogens and one oxygen in it. Okay? Uh, carbon dioxide always has one carbon and two oxygens in it. Those were always made in that way. There was no, no leeway at all for any changes in there. So <clears throat> if we look at it in terms of the law of different proportions, what happens is this. If you look at water in the example down below, the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen by mass in water is going to be 8 to 1. We found that all the time. Water always has an 8 to 1 ratio. It turns out if the mass of an oxygen atom is 16 times that of a hydrogen, then that ratio actually explains what we see in a water molecule. Notice in a water molecule, there's one oxygen and two hydrogen. 
So we can't have fractions of atoms. Remember, the an atom was an indivisible particle. We can't take half of a hydrogen atom. We can't take a third of an oxygen atom. Nothing like that. And so we find out that these will always form in these kinds of ratios, these nice whole number ratios that we can look at. So how does the atomic theory help? Well, again, continued here. Let's look at the law of multiple proportions. The previous slide was definite proportions. That's the one that tells us that each compound is made out of that the compound is made out of always the same combination of elements in the same ratio. Atoms in the same ratio. Let's look at the multiple proportions. Remember, the law of multiple proportions, it turns out we can have, for example, water, which is H2O. We can also have hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, which means we can combine the same atoms in different combinations. Okay, and so if we take a look at this slide, in the very first arrangement we've got, I've got one hydrogen atom and one oxygen. The oxygens are the red, hydrogens are the gray. The mass of oxygen to hydrogen in that particular species would be 16 to 1. If I look at the second one, down here, what I find out is this is, this is water, isn't it? And what it has is 16 mass units of oxygen for 2 mass units of hydrogen is an 8 to 1 ratio. If I go to hydrogen peroxide, down here, I have 2 oxygens and 2 hydrogens, and I have a ratio of 16 to 1. And if I go to the final one, uh, he actually has a name, won't worry about it for right now, uh, and look at that, I have three hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, the ratio by mass is 16 to 3. There's an infinite number of ways we can put these things together, you might imagine. We could string lots of oxygen atoms together, for example, and do this kind of thing. For oxygen and hydrogen, it turns out the only combinations that are particularly helpful are those in the second and third row in, in terms of existing as actual compounds. So, in the second row is water, the third row is hydrogen peroxide. The other species have some importance to us, but not as standalone neutral compounds. So if we look at the mass relationships we can gather up from Dalton's atomic theory, here's an example of how this works out. Don't get too stressed about the math parts. Just kind of sit back, put your feet up, and think about this. Octane. You may have heard of octane. It's a compound we often use to simulate gas gasoline. Uh, it can be decomposed to give 5.3 parts by mass of carbon to one part by mass of hydrogen. There's no way you would know that at this point from anything that you've seen on this slide. I'm just telling you that's what we find out. The question is, how many grams of carbon are produced when 150 grams of gasoline is decomposed? And it's kind of like a ratioing problem, if you think about it in that context. So if I have 5.3 parts of ma by mass of carbon and one part by mass of hydrogen, that means altogether I can look at 6.3 parts of material. I had the 5.3 and the 1.0, so overall I have 6.3 parts of mass. Of those 5.3 parts of mass, it turns out that the carbon is 5.3 of them, right? So the 6.3 parts, uh, parts of mass, 5.3 are carbon, so the fraction that's carbon is 5.3 over 6.3. If I take that ratio, that 0.84 down there in the next to the last line, and just multiply it by the mass of octane I have, it tells me how many grams of carbon I've got. In this case, I have 126 grams of carbon. So this is kind of a, a look at Dalton's atomic theory. We'll take modifications from it. It's a very important thing. I think the key things to pull out of it are the idea that, that when you carry out a chemical change, all you're doing is rearranging how atoms are connected to each other, and that ends up with us understanding the law of conservation of mass a little bit better. You should take the self-assessment for Unit 7. Unit 7 will be covered on Quiz 2 on the midterm and the final.